Our speaker will be introduced by Ellie Lieber, class of 2011. Ellie serves on the San Antonio Alumni Chapter Board and is the PR manager for CRIT USA, a nonprofit pediatric outpatient rehab for children ages 18 and under. Ellie? Dr. Amir Kaisi joined Trinity University in 2003 after earning a PhD degree in Health Services Administration, Research and Policy from the University of Minnesota. Prior to that, he earned a Master of Public Health and Hospital Administration from the American University of Beirut in his native Lebanon. At Trinity, Dr. Kaisi teaches courses in institutional healthcare management, healthcare strategic planning and marketing, and healthcare human resource management. His interests of research include convenient care, retail clinics, leadership, strategic planning, and quality of care and patient safety. He has published extensively on these topics in various administrative and clinical peer-reviewed journals. In 2014, Dr. Kaisi authored a book entitled Flipping Healthcare Through Retail Clinics and Other Convenient Care Models, a resource on new delivery models published by IGI Global. Dr. Kaisi also works with hospitals and health systems on strategic and business planning and marketing projects. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Amir Kaisi. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Very good. It, it's a pleasure to be here. As some of you remember, about three years ago, I, I had the privilege of speaking with this group through this lecture series, and at the time, the Affordable Care Act was the hot topic. So we talked about Obamacare, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? <laughs> and the topic I'm gonna talk about today is a little bit more specific than that. It deals with uh, convenient care models. But nonetheless, it's as important because it's a topic that affects all of us as healthcare consumers and as healthcare patients. But before my, I start my talk, let me share with you a personal story. This is my son, Adam. He turns eight in a couple weeks. Um, three years ago, at the time this picture was taken, when he was five, he woke up one Saturday morning complaining from fever and pain in his ears. Okay? So he had a history of ear infections, so my wife and myself kind of knew what he needed. Right? He needed <laughs> antibiotics. Most kids who have ear infections need antibiotics. So we started thinking about, okay, what are our options? As a parent, the minute you read that reading on the thermometer, your mind starts racing through the options. Where can we go? Who can see us on a Saturday morning? And the most important question, who can give us antibiotics, right? Um, this being Saturday morning, the pediatrician's office was not an option. <laughs> pediatrician's office was closed, right? As most doctor's offices are on Saturday morning. Now, we could have waited till Monday to take him to the pediatrician office. As most of you parents know, that when you wait till Monday morning to make an appointment with the doctor, their first reaction is gonna be, we don't have any spots. And then if you beg hard enough, they'll say, well, maybe we'll squeeze him in on Monday afternoon, right? So you go on Monday afternoon with tens of other sick kids, wait in the office for at least two hours, finally see the doctor for five minutes, get your antibiotics, drive to the pharmacy, wait for another half an hour if you're lucky, and finally get that first dose of antibiotic by Monday evening. Okay, so that would have been the option. And then he would start feeling better probably by Tuesday or Wednesday. But in terms of convenience, he would have to stay at home Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, right? And his parents would have to take time off from work for a simple ear infection, probably two or three days off of work for a simple ear infection. So that was the first option, wait till Monday. The second option was to take him to the emergency room. All right? There are a number of emergency rooms in the area where we live. That option comes with two major inconveniences or healthcare hassles. The first of them is the wait time. Wait times in emergency rooms can go up to eight or 12 hours. Average wait time is four hours. Okay? The other major hassle is the cost you probably would have to pay something a little bit more than uh, $600, about $600 for an ear infection, okay? What makes things especially, what makes us especially sensitive to that price is we have a high deductible health plan, okay? So we have to pay the full cost out of pocket 
meet our deductible before insurance kicks in. So we probably would have to pay the full cost out of our own pocket. So the emergency room was not an option, okay? We thought about other options. The other possibility would have been a pediatric urgent care center. And these have been appearing all over town. If you've been paying close attention, you'll see an urgent care center almost at every corner. They're, they're like Starbucks these days, right? <laughs> uh, now, urgent care is a little bit more convenient in that, and, and we've tried these in the past, we've had reasonably good experience. Um, wait times on average are about 20 to 40 minutes, but it all depends on your luck. Sometimes you can wait up to three hours, and sometimes they can see you right away because of the walk-in nature of the urgent care, right? The cost would be about $100, so better than the emergency room, but still something significant for an ear infection. Another option would have been those new clinics, which I'm going to talk about in depth today, called the Minute Clinics or the Retail Clinics. And, and we have one next door at the CVS store. Um, for these, the wait time is surprisingly low, about 15 minutes, and the cost is about $85. Okay, so that's a little bit more convenient than the other options. As we started thinking about these options, I remembered that one new service that my health insurance, Aetna, has offered recently at the time was a service called White Glove. Now, White Glove is a service that, you know, uh, Aetna is offering through Trinity, which is my employer, obviously. And that service allows you to call a nurse and have the nurse come to your home and examines you in the comfort of your home. So we kind of debated it, we talked about it. It's kind of a little bit strange to have a full stranger come to your house and examine your child, but we decided to give it a go. We said, okay, let's, let's try it, okay? So we called White Glove at 10 a.m., paid by credit card, paid about $25 by credit card, okay? And they said, okay, the nurse will be there at noon. Sure enough, at noon, professional, competent nurse showed up with a big bag and an iPad. She walked in, Adam was in his PJs in the living room, right? In the comfort of his living room. She examined him, checked his ears, said, yep, his ears are red, it's an ear infection. And guess what? I'm gonna give you the antibiotic right now. So as parents, we were like, whoa, <laughs> right? Thank you. Antibiotic right now. She proceeded to prepare the antibiotic in our living room, gave him his first dose at noon, so he had four more doses by Sunday night, okay? Woke up on Monday morning, <laughs> feeling better, happy, no need to miss school. Parents don't have to miss work, okay? So this presentation is gonna talk about those healthcare hassles that we all face as healthcare consumers on Saturday mornings and on weeknight evenings, okay? We're gonna talk about the underlying problems that lead to those healthcare hassles. And then I'm gonna discuss some of the convenient care models that have appeared in healthcare over the last 10 or 15 years that are trying to fix some of these problems. We'll end the discussion with a talk about what, what the future holds for, for convenient care. The first healthcare hassle that most consumers face and that we faced is the fact that most doctor's offices are open only 35 hours per week, okay? In fact, if you look at the office hours of most doctors, you'll see that they're open Monday to Friday from eight to five. Well, guess what? Most of us are at work during that time, okay? So the very act of going to the doctor is inconvenient because of the hours that the doctor's offices are open. By the way, have you ever wondered why most doctor's offices are closed on Friday afternoon? <laughs> yep, that's where the doctors are on Friday afternoon. But, but on a more serious note, the research shows us that about two-thirds of doctor's offices in this country do not have any arrangement for evening hours or weekend hours, okay? So what happens when people have minor healthcare issues on evenings and on weekends? Where do they end up going to? The emergency room, absolutely. The only option for after-hour cares for a lot of people is the emergency room. When more and more of us go to the emergency room for colds and sore throats and ear infections, the emergency room becomes overcrowded. Wait times increase in the emergency room. Research shows us that almost 70% of emergency room visits are neither immediate nor emergent. It's called the emergency room for a reason, right? 
It should be for life-threatening emergent conditions. But most of us are using the emergency room for minor healthcare conditions. Now, the reason why this is serious is that once we start using the emergency room for non-urgent, semi-urgent, and urgent conditions, that takes away physicians and nurses from the immediate and emergent conditions. And as a result, conditions that have to be seen immediately or that have to be seen within 15 minutes, the average actual wait time is 28 minutes and 37 minutes. So this is not just a convenience issue, this is a safety issue for people that are showing up at the emergency room. Okay? The other major hassle that most people experience when they move in to a new town, if, you're trying, if you just moved into town and you're trying to find a primary care doctor, you will uh, be surprised to know that the wait time to find an appointment with a family practice physician is about three weeks. Okay? Think about it. Three weeks to get an appointment as a new patient. Okay? Now, as... <laughs> <laughs> as, as Americans, we tend, we tend to look down at other countries that have national healthcare systems, right? The Canadians and the British, because they're famous for those notorious long, long waiting lists. Well, the research shows that we're not doing that much better in terms of wait times. That problem is especially important for people with Medicare and Medicaid. The research shows us that the um, acceptance rate, I'm sorry, did I miss? Oh. The, the acceptance rate for, for Medicare and Medicaid is even worse than, than most patients, okay? Now, if you really think about it, if you get an appointment within three weeks, you're very lucky. Because most doctor's offices are overextended or at full capacity, okay? So trying to get an appointment with a new doctor is, is, is really, really hard. And, and that is especially important for patients who are on Medicare and Medicaid. So if you try to get a new appointment, don't be surprised that that will tell you, you know, the, the doctor is not taking any new patients. If you're on Medicaid, the acceptance rate, doctor acceptance rate is about 45%. 55% of doctors are not taking any new Medicaid patients, okay? And 24% of doctors are not taking any new Medicare patients. Okay? That, that's, that's something very serious. Okay. Now, assuming that you got an appointment, you're driving to the doctor's office, another major hassle is that most doctor's offices are located in busy and hard to access medical centers. Okay. And the reason why doctor's offices are located in these inconvenient places is because it's convenient for the doctor, right? So for those doctors, it's easy for them to cross the street, go check on their patients at the hospital, or if they're called in for an emergency. But for most of us healthcare consumers, driving in traffic and having to pay very high amounts on parking is simply not convenient. Okay? Now, once you show up at the doctor's office, another major hassle is the amount of forms that you have to fill out, <laughs> right? It seems like every time you go to see your doctor, you ask to fill, the, to fill out the same exact form over and over and over. Healthcare is the only industry left that hasn't figured out a way to have you fill out your form online before you come to the office and just fill it out once, hit send, and that's it. Okay, we, have, we haven't figured out that. Okay. Now, assuming that you filled out your forms, you're good to go, the other thing you have to do is your copay, right? Your copay seems to be increasing and rising recently. And as we discussed, people who have a high deductible health plan with a health saving account now have to pay the full cost of their visit out of pocket. Now that wouldn't have been that bad if you knew exactly how much you have to pay ahead of time. But one other hassle that we have in healthcare is there is really no price transparency. None of us knows how much we're gonna pay before we go to the doctor, okay? It's a total mystery, right? And then you get a, a bill afterwards, you get a statement afterwards, and you have no idea how to read it. <laughs> you just, no idea. You, you don't know how to read and how, what's, your, what's your portion, what's the insurance portion. It's very hard to read, right? Okay. Now, you're at the doctor's office, you paid your copay, you filled out the forms, and you're waiting, right? And then you're waiting, and then you're waiting some more. First, you wait in the general waiting area, okay? <laughs> and you're entertaining yourself with some old magazines, <laughs> right, trying to read some old magazines, and finally the nurse comes and gets you, and you're like, okay, that's it, now I can see the doctor. But no, you have to wait some more inside the small room, 
where there's literally nothing to do. <laughs> it's, it's almost like watching dry paint, right? It's almost. And then, finally, the doctor shows up and says, tell me everything you tell the nurse, right? Just everything you just told her, repeat it, please. Okay. And then the doctor proceeds to spend probably about 10 minutes with you, if you're lucky, right? Maximum 10 minutes. Almost feels like doctors are pushing you out after they've seen you. They're trying to get rid of you, right? Okay. So on a more serious note, as a summary, we have a number of hassles in our uh, healthcare system. Physicians' offices are closed after hours. We have to wait a long time to get an appointment as a new patient. Doctors not taking new patients. They are located in inconvenient locations. There are too many forms to fill out. Out-of-pocket costs are increasing. There's no price transparency. There are long wait times at the doctor's office and the appointments themselves are very, very short. It seems like healthcare or us in healthcare have designed a system that is designed around the preferences of the provider, but not the preference of the patient or the consumer. In that sense, healthcare is the only industry that have not taken the preferences of the consumer into consideration. Now, before we go blaming the doctors for all of these problems, there are important systematic issues that lead to these healthcare hassles. There are problems in the system itself that contribute to these healthcare issues. One of these problems is that we do not have enough doctors, especially primary care doctors, family physicians, internal medicine, pediatrics, OBGYN. Okay? We don't have enough of them now, and we won't have enough of them in 10 or 15 years. That's, that's a fact. Okay? The numbers show us that the supply of doctors over the next 10 years is going to increase only slightly, but the demand for physician services is going to increase drastically. Now, demand is going to increase because, as we all know, there is population growth. The population is getting older. More and more people now have chronic diseases, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity. So all of these factors are contributing to an increase in demand, but we don't have enough doctors to meet those demands. And oh, by the way, the Affordable Care Act, one of the unintended consequences of the Affordable Care Act was to provide more insurance to more people. When people have more insurance, which is a great thing, what is the first thing they're going to do? They're going to try to go see a doctor, right? So thank you, Obamacare, right, <laughs> for, for that <laughs> unintended consequence. But, but it, it is a fact. It's great to have more people with more insurance, but we need to be able to have doctors to take care of these people. Okay. <clears throat> now, why, why is it that we don't have enough primary care doctors? Okay. What, what is, what is the, the issue? The issue is that most medical students prefer to go into specialties versus primary care. And the reason is very simple. It all comes down to money. If you compare the average starting salary of a family practitioner versus a cardiologist versus a neurosurgeon, okay, family practitioner starts at about 145000 Still a decent living, right? Well, when you factor in the amount of debt that they have when they finish medical school, maybe it's not. But compare that to cardiologists, which make twice as much, or neurosurgeons, which make three times as much, starting salary. So when you really think about it, it's, you can't blame the medical students for choosing the sexy specialties, right, versus the plain primary care where they're getting paid, um, you know, peanuts compared to the other options. Another major problem that we don't think about that much as healthcare consumers because we don't think about things from the perspective of the doctors, is that the reason your doctor is spending only 10 minutes with you is because those doctors have to work harder now to maintain their income levels. Okay? So for doctors, time is money. And they have to overbook in their schedule to make sure that they maintain their income levels. Okay? Another major systematic problem we have in our healthcare system is the current system rewards quantity over, of services versus the quality of the services. So for any doctor, seeing 40 patients is more profitable than seeing 30 patients, right? That doctor could be a mediocre doctor, but if he or she is seeing 40 to 50 patients per day, they're making more money, okay? And that's a systematic problem in our system. The numbers show us that 
In the last 15 years, the cost of running a medical practice have been steadily increasing. But since 2009, what doctors get paid when they see a Medicare patient has seen a drastic increase. Now, when we, see, when we say Medicare, that means all of the other insurance companies follow. Okay, what Medicare does, the insurance companies do. So that applies also for private insurance. Doctors are getting paid less and less for the same services that they provided before. As a result, many doctors are now burnt out. Many doctors um, feel that it's not worth it anymore. This job is not worth it. They have to deal with insurance companies. They have to deal with paperwork. They have to deal with malpractice lawsuits. A recent uh, study has shown that actually when, when you ask doctors if they were to do it all over again, about a quarter of them say they would not recommend medicine as a field for friends and family members. Okay? Because of all of these problems, many doctors are leaving medicine altogether. There is a huge number of doctors that are retiring early. Okay? And that explains why we have so many medical TV shows these days. <laughs> All of them are on TV now. <laughs> so to summarize the problems, we don't have enough primary care doctors. Okay? Many of them are, have to see more patients to, uh, and they have to overbook their schedules and many of them are burnt out and are retiring early. Okay? So what are some of the convenient care models that have appeared in healthcare in the last 10 to 15 years that can help us overcome some of these hassles and some of these problems? Convenient care is a term that I use to refer to services that are cheaper, delivered in more convenient settings, and as effective as traditional physician offices. Okay? In management language, we refer to these as disruptive innovations. Okay? So they're new ways of doing things that disrupt the status quo and make things a little bit better for the consumers. For example, if the existing model that I just described the emergency room and the doctor's office is care provided by costly providers who are overqualified most of the time to treat very simple conditions like colds and sore throats in centralized locations at inconvenient times and very expensive uh, prices. The disruptive innovation is something that is provided at, by less costly providers practicing at the top of their license, which I will explain in a few minutes, in decentralized locations at convenient times and at lower prices, okay? Now, to better explain what a disruptive innovation is, let me borrow an example from another industry. Let me borrow an example from banking, okay? Do you all remember this scene at your local bank, right? Many of us remember a time when if you wanted to withdraw $20 from your bank account, you had to take time off of work, drive to the bank, find the parking spot, wait in line, fill out the form, wait for the teller, get your $20, and then drive back to work, right? The whole transaction probably took 45 minutes. Well, guess what? Something has replaced all of that, and that something is the ATM, okay? Now, that transaction can be done in 30 to 45 seconds because ATMs are in decentralized locations, are in convenient locations. They're at the mall. They're at the grocery store. They're at the airport. You can get that very simple thing, which is withdraw $20 or deposit a check, be done very easily and very conveniently. That's what we're talking about. Retail clinics, which I will discuss in a few minutes, are an example of a disruptive innovation in healthcare. It is very similar to what, to what ATMs have done in banking. First of all, what are retail clinics? Retail clinics are located in grocery stores, drug stores, and general merchandise retailers. So, the most famous example is the CVS Minute Clinic that some of you may be familiar with. Walgreens has its own brand. It's called the Take Care Clinic. And then some of you may have visited the clinic at the HEV. It's called the Ready Clinic, okay? Now, right away, you can see the convenience, right? These are clinics that are located in settings that consumers visit several times a week anyways. So you're at your local HEV, you're getting your bread and your milk, and you say to yourself, oh, by the way, let me go check on that cough, right? They're right there where you already are. You don't have to make a separate trip to get your healthcare need taken care of. Another major aspect of retail clinics is this is walk-in 
with no appointments necessary. Okay? I can just walk in and take care of my healthcare needs. Now, a very important uh, point to make is that retail clinics treat minor, straightforward conditions. These are conditions that are easy to diagnose and easy to treat. You don't go to the retail clinic for heart disease. You don't go there for cancer. You don't go there if you were in a car accident or um, uh, if you broke your, your arm, okay? Very, very simple conditions. Upper respiratory tract infections, urinary tract infections, allergies, physical exams, vaccinations, sports physicals, etc. Okay? Back to the ATM example. Just like you don't get your mortgage approved at the ATM, right? You have to go to the bank and see a real person at the bank to get your mortgage approved. Same applies here. You're not going to go to the retail clinic for the major chronic diseases. This is for simple minor conditions. And because this is for simple minor conditions, the care can be provided by a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant practicing at the top of their license, as I already mentioned. So these are people that are um, practicing there under the supervision of a doctor. However, the doctor does not have to be physically present at the clinic all the time. Okay? So most clinics have a medical director, and that medical director is available remotely on call to be called in case there is a problem, and that medical director reviews the charts of the patients and makes sure that the care being provided is high quality care. Now before we move on, let's, let's spend just a little bit of time talking about nurse practitioners and physician assistants. Because many people don't understand the kind of education that these healthcare professionals get. Nurse practitioners are your typical nurses who have received an additional master's degree and have the training to treat minor medical conditions. Now, no one is arguing that a nurse practitioner gets as much education as a family practitioner. Okay? That is a, an obvious fact that they get less. However, for colds and sore throats and allergies, nurse practitioners are more than qualified to treat those conditions very effectively. There is tons of healthcare research, scientific research, that shows that nurse practitioners as well as physician assistants can treat those conditions and provide quality care that is as good, if not better, than the care provided by the doctor. Okay, this is scientific research that shows that. Patient satisfaction is much higher than the doctor's office because nurse practitioners and physician assistants tend to spend more time with patients because they have the time. Okay? Another major aspect of retail clinics that is totally revolutionary in healthcare, right? We talked about lack of price transparency. At the retail clinic, there is a menu, or you can go online and find exactly how much you're going to pay for each service ahead of time. Okay, it's almost like the dollar menu at McDonald's, right? You can see exactly how much you're going to pay ahead of time, which is a huge satisfier for patients. Now, if you're not insured, you're going to have to pay the full cost out of pocket. But if you have insurance, once you walk into the retail clinic, the same copay that you would pay for your primary care physician applies here. So about $25 to $35. Okay. The hours of operation are another uh, convenience aspect. Most retail clinics are open when the stores are open. So Monday to Friday, they close at 7.30, they're open on the weekend. Huge convenience factor and huge um, satisfaction factor for patients. The major players, as I said, are CVS and Walgreens and, and Ready Clinic and Target. There are about 1,800 retail clinics in the country right now. Half of these are CVS Minute Clinics. Okay. Now, when retail clinics first appeared on the healthcare scene, many people thought that this is going to be a solution for people who don't have insurance. Okay? That this is going to solve the problem of the uninsured. Well, not really. Okay. For many people with no insurance, $85 is a lot of money. When the other option is to go in the ER, to go to the ER and get, get uh, the county hospital and get treated for free. <coughs> Plus, a lot of the research that has been done shows that most retail clinics tend to be located in affluent suburbs. So the retailers on purpose put them in areas with high socioeconomic status because they're really going after insured middle class families people who are busy with kids, right? people who, for whom convenience is, is a big factor and who have disposable income. Basically, they're after the soccer moms. Okay? That's the target population. 
In a recent survey, a soccer mom said, you know, I was satisfied because I need to drive one mile to the retail clinic, wait five minutes, see the nurse for 10 minutes, walk over the pharmacy counter, get my prescription, everything is done in 30 minutes. That's the convenience aspect of retail clinics, okay? In a recent uh, study done by Geisinger Healthcare System, which has its own retail clinics, they compared something called net promoter score of retail clinics to other companies. Now, net promoter score is a measure used to see how many people who use the service will recommend it to friends and family members, okay? So, as you can see, retail clinics, only USAA has a better net promoter score than retail clinics. Apple hardware has a 71% net promoter score. So if you like your iPhone, you're definitely going to like retail clinics. <laughs> <laughs> now, an important question to ask is why do people go to retail clinics? For those people who have visited in the past, why have they visited the retail clinic? Well, the convenience aspect is there, right? Don't need to make an appointment. It took my insurance, convenient location, it wasn't expensive, I didn't have to wait too long, open when the doctor's office wasn't, and so on and so forth. Cost factor is very important. When we compare cost of retail clinic versus other alternatives such as urgent care, the physician's office, or the emergency room, you can definitely see the cost savings for the patient, but also for the healthcare system in general. And the reason retail clinics can provide care at those prices is because they have nurse practitioners and physician assistants who get paid less per year than your uh, family physician. Now, ever since retail clinics have appeared, doctors have been really complaining about them and questioning the quality of care being provided in this grocery store, right? What kind of care are you gonna get if you're getting it in a grocery store? And, and a lot of professional physician associations have taken very, very strong positions against retail clinics. The American Academy of Family Physicians um, did not endorse them. And the most vehement opposition has come from the American Academy of Pediatrics, which said that it strongly discourages their use for children, okay? So, you've got on one side doctors saying, no, we don't like them, they don't provide good quality of care. So where, where, where's the evidence? In the last few years, there have been a number of scientific studies that have examined the kind of care being provided at retail clinic and the quality of care provided, okay? I'm gonna talk about two of these studies very briefly. The first one looked at whether retail clinic providers adhere to guidelines when they're treating acute pharyngitis, okay? It's, it's an upper respiratory tract infection. And the results of that study showed that retail clinic providers do not overprescribe antibiotics, which is a measure of poor quality, right? So retail clinic providers prescribe antibiotics the same way as doctors do. Another major study looked at three conditions treated at retail clinics. Ear infections, uh, pharyngitis, and urinary tract infections. And they calculated a composite quality score comparing retail clinics with other alternatives. The results show that the quality score for retail clinics is as good, if not better, than physician's office, better than urgent care, and much, much better than your typical emergency room visit. So these are just two studies, but there have been a number of other studies, and the evidence is pretty conclusive that retail clinic providers adhere to clinical quality guidelines and provide healthcare quality for minor conditions that is as good, if not better, than the alternatives. Another major complaint that doctors have had is possibility for fragmentation of care. So doctors argue that when you go and visit a retail clinic and your doctor doesn't know about it, your doctor is not gonna know what happened during the visit and what medications you took in that visit. Okay, so there is a possibility for fragmentation of care. The care is not continuous. Now to examine that claim, we need to ask ourselves, okay, for those people who go to a retail clinic, where would they have gone if the retail clinic was not there? Okay, so looking at that, a study asked uh, uh, retail clinic users, what would you have done today if the retail clinic was not an option? As you can see, about 30% of people said, I would just have waited and see what was gonna happen. 26% go to the emergency room, go to urgent care, or go to any clinic that would see me. Now what these numbers tell us is that about two thirds of retail clinic visitors do not have a primary care physician relationship to start with, okay? So these are people that don't have 
a relationship with a primary care physician. Ativ Merotra is, one of, is a physician that studies retail clinics. And based on his research, he, he said, um, some have raised the concern that retail clinics may disrupt primary care relationships. We found that three-fifths of patients did not report having a primary care physician. So for these patients, there is really no relationship to disrupt. These are patients that are using the retail clinic as their primary source of care, not instead of their primary care doctor. Who are these people? Who are people who don't have a primary care physician relationship? Yeah. Well, men and women, but mostly men. Mostly men ages 18 to 45 who think, who think they're healthy enough, right? I'm healthy enough, why do I need a doctor? If they have a cold or a sore throat or, or uh, an allergy, allergy symptoms, they need to go to a place that treats that fast and convenient way. So if we were to give a report card to retail clinics, on convenience, they probably get a B plus because they're located in grocery stores, so you're going there anyways. Right? But you still have to get in your car to get the care. Cost is also a B plus. Um, you still have to pay $85 if you don't have insurance. Quality, as we said, um, the research shows us that they're as good, if not better, than um, the alternatives. Access is a B because, um, as we said, there's only 1,800 clinics in the country right now, which is a very small number. Plus, um, as we said, some of them tend to be located in, in uh, richer areas you don't really find a lot of retail clinics in underserved areas. Okay. So that's the first option that we discuss is retail clinics. Okay. Another major option, as, as I said, that, that we consider that Saturday, afternoon, that Saturday morning and that most people consider when they need care for, for uh, after hours is urgent care centers. While retail clinics have appeared on the healthcare scene in the last 10 to 15 years, urgent care has been around for a long, long time. Urgent care centers tend to be located in freestanding in, in strip malls. Most of you may be familiar with the Texas Med Clinic, right? That's, that's the main source of urgent care that we all know. Now, the main difference between the retail clinic and the urgent care center is at the urgent care center, there's always one doctor available on site, okay? Now, you may get your care from a doctor or a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant, but there is a physician that is present there 100% of the time, at least one physician. And the reason why there needs to be a physician there is because the care provided at the urgent care center is more complex than the care provided at the retail clinics. So urgent care centers can treat serious but non-life-threatening conditions. We're talking anything from sprains, strains, lacerations, confusions, fractures, um, even minor surgeries. They have a lab, they have x-ray. So the urgent care center provides care that is more complex and more serious than care at retail clinics. The cost is also higher. Okay? Most urgent care centers charge about 9,595 to 125 per visit. And even if you have insurance, some health plans will make you pay a copay that is higher than your primary care physician copay. Okay? So the so cost is a factor here, but as we said, the care being provided is more complex. Major players include some big companies with deep pockets. You've got Concentra, you've got Dignity Health, and so on and so forth. However, the majority of urgent care centers remain mom and pop shops, okay? These are a physician here, a physician there, entrepreneurs opening their own urgent care centers and, and trying to make ends meet. As I mentioned earlier, if, if you're really paying attention, especially in San Antonio, you'll see that urgent care centers are just mushroomed all over the place. I did a quick search around the area where we live, and within one mile, I found about five urgent care center options, okay? They, they really have... Uh, boomed in the last few years. Comparing the numbers, retail clinics, as I said, there's about 1,800 clinics in the country right now. There's four times as many urgent care centers. Okay, so that helps with access. The reason why people go to the urgent care center are very, very similar to the reason why people go to, uh, to the retail clinic. You know, it's open when the doctor's office is not, no need for an appointment, convenient location, less expensive and the wait time is not as long as the emergency room. Okay. If we were to evaluate urgent care centers, we'd probably give it a B on convenience because you still have to drive to get the care. Cost is a B because they're more expensive and, and the copays are higher. Quality is, is very, very high. And access is, is a B plus, um, probably because um, the 
Urgent care centers also tend to be located in areas with higher socioeconomic status. So although there's more of them, they tend to locate them in areas where people have disposable income and have insurance. Another major option for interacting with your doctor that have appeared in healthcare in the last few years is the use of online technology to connect patients with providers. Okay? We refer to these services as telehealth services and these provide the ability for patients for minor conditions, so very similar to the retail clinics, to have 24-7 access to a nurse practitioner. Okay? So it's 2 a.m. in the morning, you have a healthcare issue, you don't want to go to the ER, you can log in through your tablet or through your computer or through your phone and go through a number of questions, you answer questions based on your symptoms, about 30 to 40 questions, those questions are received by a nurse practitioner on the other end. The nurse practitioner makes a diagnosis and sends you your diagnosis by email or by text and sends your, preferred, uh, sends your prescription to your preferred pharmacy. Okay. There are a number of services that are like this. This is one example. This is a company called Virtual out of Minnesota. And as you can see, you can log in and it asks you what do you think you have and you answer the questions and then you get a diagnosis. Okay. Now, the obvious concern here is quality, right? You're, you're wondering, okay, what kind of care am I gonna get if I'm not seeing the provider, okay? I've talked with a lot of people that are behind these services, and they say that they have a very, very uh, thorough quality assurance uh, program in place in that the online interview stops if there is a red flag and you are asked to go to your doctor. For example, if you're, go you're answering the questions and you mention that you've been having burning while urinating for 10 days or more, the interview stops and they say, you, we can't take care of you online, you have to go and see a doctor because you need to have a urine test done, okay? Or if you have a child and you complain about a sore throat with no other symptoms, the interview stops and says, you may have strep and strep can all be treated um, through a strep test, so you need to go to your doctor's office, okay? So there is quality assurance in place, but we still don't have studies that document that. Many of these services are provided at a very, very low fee, even if you don't have insurance, okay? So this is 20 to $45. Most of them do not take insurance, but you can file the claim with your insurance company. This is a recent study that looked at um, uh, Virtual, which I just mentioned, which is a clinic part of Health Partners in Minnesota, and found that there are cost savings of about $88 per episode when you compare those clinics to emergency rooms and doctor's offices. Plus, they get a lot of uh, high patient approval because the patients are really satisfied when you have convenient care in your own home. Another facet of this is you can email or text your provider, or you can have a face-to-face -face video chat with your physician or your nurse practitioner. So this is using Skype-like technology to connect you with your doctor at any time of the day or the night. Okay. In summary, online services get about an A-plus on convenience. You really can't beat Logging in, log in from, your, from your bedroom at 2 a.m. in the morning and, and connecting with a doctor, right? The cost is also an A+. Plus. As we said, the cost is very, very low. Quality is an incomplete. We still don't have enough studies that document quality of care. Although, as I said, when I talk with, with the people who are behind some of these services, they say, well, think about it. When you go through an online interview, you are being asked 40 questions. And the program never forgets to ask any of these questions. Whereas when you're at the doctor's office or at your, with your nurse practitioner and they're pressed with time, they might forget to ask you some questions, okay? So that, that's their argument. And access is a B plus because these services are, are currently offered in only a few states. For example, we don't have a service like this in Texas and you still need an internet connection or a smartphone to do that, okay? The last uh, disruptive innovation I'm gonna talk about is house call services. As I mentioned earlier, house call services are making a comeback in healthcare now. Back in the days, it was the norm to call the doctor to come to the home, but that seemed to have disappeared, but now it's coming back with, with nurse practitioners and doctors making home, off, home visits. So the idea is you call the, doc, the nurse practitioner, he or she comes to your home or to your, work of, uh, your place of work for minor conditions, just like the retail clinics. Um, they make the diagnosis, perform the test at home, and they send your prescription to your preferred pharmacy. Okay? One, one such example, as we said, is White Glove, which is the service that we ended up using that other day. 
and, and it has been uh, uh, very successful with patients. Now, how does this work? How much do you have to pay? White Glove, for example, has an annual membership. Okay? You can either buy that membership individually or through your employers. So, for example, Trinity through Aetna provided that as a benefit to its employees. So we didn't have to pay the annual membership. But if you were to do this individually, you'll have to pay $400 per year, and then the visit fee is $25 paid by credit card over the phone. House calls, report card, on convenience is probably an A. Again, the nurse is coming to your home. On cost is a B because it's expensive if you have to pay the full annual membership out of pocket. Quality is still in incomplete. We don't have studies on house call services yet. And access is a B because you have to have that, that uh, service before you can uh, have, uh, be able to call the nurse. Okay? So let's make sense of some of these options. I know I've, I've covered a lot of models. In brief, retail clinics, online clinics, and house call services are for minor conditions. We're talking very, very simple stuff, strep throats, ear aches, allergies, minor burns, what have you, okay? Urgent care is a little bit more complex. If you have cuts or you have broken bones, sprains and strains, you probably go to urgent care. Doctor's office is still the best place to manage chronic conditions and to get your physical exam, as well as some of the other minor stuff. Emergency room is where you go for major life-threatening emergent stuff, right? Strokes, heart attacks, shortness of breath, major burns, and so on and so forth. Summary of the report cards. As you can see, um, house call services and online services win it when it comes to convenience. Online is the best in terms of cost. When it comes to quality, we don't have a lot of evidence on the other options, but retail and urgent care are better. And then when it comes to access, they all have their issues. So what does the future hold? Okay, many experts predict that we're going to see increased utilization and we're going to see new models that are within that same area of convenient care. The number of retail clinics is expected to increase by twofold over the next three years. Okay, we're expecting about 3,000 clinics. Many people who have used a retail clinic will say, yes, I will use it again. Many patients are now open to interacting with their provider by email, online chat, text message, um, an app through their phone. So patients are more and more open to these kind of interactions with their providers. And we're seeing also a lot of new cool models. I'm going to talk about a few of them. One of those models is something called HealthSpot. Okay? So this is a station that is located at the mall or at the airport or at the rest stop. You walk into the station. There is a doctor at the other end of the line. So this is electronic connection with the doctor. The really cool thing about this is that the services and the devices that are available in the station allow the doctor to look in your ear, look in your nose, examine your skin, um, check your blood oxygen level, and so on and so forth. It, it, it's, it's very, very interesting, and it's just starting to appear in healthcare now. This is a seven-year-old girl in Ohio that just used the service last month. She said, um, <laughs> nice and cool, it looked like a spaceship. Another um, app that just appeared is something called Pager. This is in New York City. So if you need a doctor at 3 a.m. in the morning, you go on this app and you track all of the doctors that live in your area that are participating in this. And for the very low cost of $300 per visit, a doctor will come to you. You can actually track the doctor driving to you. <laughs> Sound, sounds like Uber, right? Sounds sound like Uber. Well, it's not a coincidence. The guy who came up with this is actually one of the engineers behind Uber. So this is the Uberization of healthcare. And then we have a whole new category called do-it-yourself healthcare, which also sounds like science fiction, but it's true. So do-it-yourself healthcare is something called the personal medical kit, which is diagnose yourself at home. Okay? This is a company called Quick, Quick Check. You use that device the same way you use a pregnancy test. So I'm not going to go into more details, okay? <laughs> and then the device gives you a code. You take that code, you go to a specific website, you enter the code. The provider on the other side sees that code and knows exactly what your diagnosis is. Makes the diagnosis and sends your prescription to your preferred pharmacy, okay? Another example, which also seems to be coming out of Star Trek, is something called Scanadu. Now, Scanadu is really cool. 
What can I do is a little device that costs about $200. You put it on your forehead. It measures your temperature, your blood pressure, blood oxygen level. It takes a full ECG reading and sends it straight to your provider. Okay, so that, that also is, is very, very impressive. Now, what's gonna happen in the future with all of these models, right? Predictions. <laughs> my, my prediction is we are looking at a two-tiered healthcare system, okay? It's gonna be a two-tiered healthcare system. The first tier is gonna be basic primary care that is delivered through some of these convenient care models that I discussed. We just don't have enough doctors to have doctors taking care of colds and sore throats, okay? We're gonna have to delegate that to nurse practitioners and physician assistants. And we're gonna have to allow this to happen in convenient locations, in convenient ways, at convenient times. Tier two in the future is gonna be complex primary care, chronic condition management, as well as specialty care. Now this has to remain where it is, in physicians' offices where you need the expertise of highly specialized and highly paid physicians, okay? Before I, I finish, I, I should do some shameless self-promotion. Um, this is my recently published book um, by the same title, Flipping Healthcare Through Retail <laughs> Clinics and Convenient Care Models. It's on Amazon, so check it out. In case you're uh, wondering where the title comes from, this is the idea of flipping things. Um, so the, the previous healthcare system or the current healthcare system is a system where the provider is at the center. All of these convenient care models that I discussed today, flip that and put the patient at the center. The term comes from academia, actually. Um, it comes from the concept of the flipped classroom. So you may have heard our students these days talking about flipped classrooms. So in the traditional classroom, the students are passive listeners in a lecture, okay? And the, the professor is at the center of the educational processes. In the flipped classroom, the professor records the lecture online. The patients watch the lecture before coming to class and then come to class and lead the discussion and the professor is just um, a facilitator. So this, this is where the idea of the flip thing came from. But I, I will end now and uh, we'll take any questions you have, but this is my email address. If you have any more questions, please feel free to contact me. And again, I'm in the Department of Healthcare Administration, which by the way, is now a top 10 program. Just had to say that. So we'll take questions. I think then you want you to go to the microphone. Doctor, for a very presentation. You're welcome. Could you discuss the uh, role of our insurance companies in these new models, and are they supportive, and sure. how are they uh, how are they reacting to yeah. this? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, let me let me talk about retail clinics, for example. So when retail clinics first appear appeared, insurance companies said, "No way, we're not going to do it." Okay. Five years later, every single major insurance plan will pay for a uh, retail clinic visit. And the reason is, these kind of services save money for the insurance companies. So it makes a lot of sense for them to cover them, okay? Now, they're still a little bit hesitant about covering some of the more, you know, forward-thinking stuff like online care or, or um, you know, the, the house call services, but they're moving in that direction. Because again, I mean, insurance companies, the majority of them are for-profit. Nothing wrong with that, but they have to satisfy their, their sh uh, shareholders, and this is one way that they can save costs and, and make more money. So they're all for that kind of stuff. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, so you talked about the supply of doctors decreasing, but uh, do you know about the supply of the non-physician providers too? Because you know this, the use of these convenient care models is going to balloon. So do we have the supply of nurse practitioners and physician assistants to take care of that? So, that, I mean, that, that's, that's a, a great question because one thing I did not mention in the lecture is we have a shortage of nurses too, okay? And nurse practitioners are nurses to start with, okay? So, yes, we do have a problem with that area too, that we don't have enough nurse practitioners and physician assistants coming in through the pipeline. And that's why we're going to have to become more and more creative about finding ways to provide the care. So, even the retail clinic model which I discussed today in which you have a nurse practitioner available from morning to evening may become obsolete in five years when we don't have enough nurses. So we may be totally switching to online where the provider can see more patients within a specific period of time. So you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, 
we, we, we rely on nurse practitioners and physician assistants while keeping in mind that they also are in short supply. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for your attention. This has been a pleasure again. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>